Oh, thank you. Welcome back. Um, so uh, we'll be continuing uh, this morning uh, with a section on WH quantification, talking about the relationship of WH items and uh, focus particles. Um, if you're looking at the handout, uh, we are on page 44. So we commonly think of question formation as the primary use of WH phrases. Um, but in many languages, we know that WHs are also used for different forms of quantification. So, uh, so we have, for example, this paradigm, uh, probably very familiar to many of you in Japanese. So we have uh, WH items in Japanese, such as dare, uh, for who, uh, used in questions. But then you also have items like dare mo, everyone, and then dare ka, someone, dare mo, anyone, NPI anyone, and dare demo, so free choice anyone. Um, and all of these, interestingly, are built on that WH word plus some extra material. And that extra material is something like a focus particle mo in a couple of these cases, uh, a disjunctive particle, perhaps, ka, um, perhaps a concessive scalar particle. I use that gloss there for demo. So kuroda, um, and uh, others since have studied this. Kuroda, in particular, called these items not interrogative items, but instead indeterminate items in a language like Japanese, uh, specifically because they can be used as nouns that behave like a logical variable, that define a domain, but then can be used for a variety of quantificational purposes. So uh, this morning, we'll be talking about exactly how that compositional semantics might work. So many languages combine WH phrases with some other material to form quantifiers. What I want to highlight is that in many cases, not just in Japanese or, or better studied languages uh, with such WH quantification, but in many other languages, um, very often what you combine with a WH is something like a disjunctor or a scalar focus particle. Um, and so in this session, I want to build on the independently motivated semantics for WH words and disjunction, which I'll introduce, and focus particles that we've been talking about, and show how they can combine productively in the alternative semantics framework that we've introduced uh, to derive these types of meanings with very little extra machinery, extra massaging that we need to do. That's the goal. Um, and I should say at the outset that this is uh, a larger project that's a work in progress of mine. Um, and uh, I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to share portions of this last year at uh, SICOG. Uh, so some of you may find some of this familiar. I want to highlight first uh, a few properties of the standard Ruthian alternative semantics that we started with on day one. Um, just a few consequences of that. So remember that in the system we are the, calculating two-dimensional meanings for items. So syntactic structures like alpha will have the ordinary value with the superscript O, as well as an alternative semantic value or focus semantic value, which can be thought of as a set of alternative denotations. That's with the superscript alt. Um, given the definitions, the recursive definitions for the alternative set that we introduced previously, as long as we're just calculating uh, in ordinary, calculating the denotations of a structure that have, that has uh, just a focus in it or no focus at all, then that Ruthian alternative semantics will guarantee that the ordinary semantic value is an element of that set of alternatives. The projacent value that a focus particle takes is in that set of alternatives. That's going to be guaranteed as long as there isn't something like a presupposition failure. Um, I'm going to codify that requirement that others have mentioned as well um, into this requirement in 156 that we call interpretability. So to interpret alpha, the ordinary value of alpha must be defined and in the set of alternatives. A second consequence worth pointing out is that focus particles are unique among lexical items in being able to actually look at alternative sets, look at that in order to calculate its denotation. 
other lexical items simply compose in the pointwise fashion that we talked about uh, in day one when we introduced alternative semantics. We'll be talking this afternoon uh, again. We'll revisit this question of why only focus particles can make reference to the alternative set. The third consequence of the standard Ruthian alternative semantics is that once alternatives from a particular focus are, let's say, used by a focus particle, once a focus particle associates with focus, looks at its alternatives, and calculates some quantificational meaning, then those alternatives can't be then used again for a higher operator. This is both an empirical point as well as a conceptual point. Um, the conceptual point that the way that this is done in uh, Ruthian alternative semantics is to say that after an operator applies, the operator ends up resetting the alternative set for the material in its complement. Um, so I'm going to codify this with a new term as well uh, called reset. I'll say that an operator is resetting if it lexically specifies that the uh, alternative set of the resulting structure, the operator and its sister, is lexically specified to be the singleton set of the ordinary value. Maybe you can hear that we have a storm here. Hopefully that's not too distracting. I want to talk about question denotations now. So we've been talking a lot about alternatives for focus. We haven't talked about questions in these lectures yet. So one prominent approach to the semantics of questions, starting with the work of Hamblin, views the meaning of a question as the set of possible answer propositions. So for example, a question like, who does Alex like, we want to represent as a set of propositions, here just written informally, as the propositions, Alex likes Brie, Alex likes Kara, Alex likes Dana, etc., ranging over the position of WH with different items that are contextually salient. And here we can just set aside the fact that there is WH movement in the input question, input structure in English. That doesn't really matter. We're just looking at uh, different substitutions for that position. So, Turns out Hamblin in 73 describes a procedure for recursively computing these sets of meanings, actually without involving WH movement, actually assuming basically a WH and C2 base. Um, and that procedure that Hamblin describes is actually essentially equivalent to the procedure that Ruth described in his dissertation for calculating focus alternatives. So that was independently discovered. But we're going to take advantage of the fact that there's an intuition that these are really the same thing. So today, I'll first give you a particular modern implementation of this idea of using WHs as alternatives for questions, but doing that in the Ruthian two-dimensional framework. So in this approach, WH phrases have a set of possible values, so roughly corresponding to short answer phrases, um, as their alternative set denotation. But they have no defined ordinary semantic value. So who, for example, in 159 has no ordinary value, but it has an alternative set denotation, which is going to range over humans or animate individuals, maybe restricted to the context. And then based on that, we will compose pointwise in the regular alternative semantics way in 160 and build this WH and C2 structure, Alex likes who. Again, because it contains a undefined value in its ordinary dimension, the ordinary semantic value is just going to be undefined. The alternative set denotation is going to give us the set of propositions exactly in the same way, exactly as we expect. It's going to be the propositions that Alex likes Brie, Alex likes Kara, and Alex likes Dana. And that's exactly the result that we might hope for. Right? That's what we want when we're calculating focus alternatives over that object position, or in this case, over an object WH question. But I want to point out that in this Ruthian two-dimensional system, the meaning that we just generated in 160 is a strange meaning. In particular, it violates interpretability. So interpretability was this statement I gave in 156 that says that the ordinary semantic value of 
the structure you interpret, let's say the, the root node of a clause, or maybe this is going to be enforced more cyclically, but let's say the root node of a clause, Alex likes who here, doesn't have an ordinary semantic value. And that's a problem because that's actually what we want to interpret. And furthermore, it violates interpretability because that's undefined. Interpretability requires that it be defined and be, a be an element of the set of alternatives. So a way to fix this has been proposed. So uh, I'll be using the notation for this from Hadas Kotek's work. Uh, in her book, she defines this operator as Alt-Shift. Um, it's an operator that has existed in the previous literature. So some previous authors actually call this interrogative C. But uh, I'll refer you to Hadassah's work on why this probably shouldn't be thought of as the meaning of interrogative C itself. It should be thought of as an independent operator. So I'll be calling this Alt-Shift. And what Alt-Shift does is it will take the alternative meaning of its complement, of its sister, and then make that the new ordinary value. That's in 161a. And then Alt-Shift will also be resetting meaning that it sets its alternative set, the alternative set of the output of Alt-Shift and its sister, to be the singleton set of that meaning just generated. It's probably slightly simpler to see a concrete example. This is 162. We take the structure that we just built in 160, composing pointwise with the WH, which ended up with an undefined ordinary value. We apply Alt-Shift to that in 162, and what we end up with is an ordinary semantic value, which now really is the denotation of a question that we want. This is the Hamblin denotation of a question. And then in 162b, the alternative set is going to be a singleton set of a question meaning. And that's fine, um, and that's going to satisfy interpretability, and I'll refer you again to Hadas Kotek's work, um, which shows how this formulation, which at first glance looks a little strange, that we're talking about a set of a question meaning, that this is exactly what we want in order to build higher level questions like multiple WH questions and to get their pairless interpretations correctly. But I won't be introducing that today. So Alt-Shift is one operator which can rescue us if we use a WH in a clause. That's this background. The second piece of background that I want to introduce is the analysis of uh, disjunction in alternative semantics. So uh, following work by uh, Alonzo Valle and uh, Maria Aloni, um, we can think of disjunction productively also as using a set of alternatives and quantifying over them. In particular, we can think that disjunction actually is made up of two steps. So one is this uh, process of creating a set of meanings. So we'll attribute that to a particular syntactic head J for junked um, following uh, Den Dickens' work. Um, so J will combine some number of elements, let's say two, and we'll create a set of those meanings. And then there's a separate process that happens higher in the structure, which is some kind of existential operator, which will then take those alternatives and actually do the existential or disjunctive quantification over them. So let's see how this works. Again, in the two-dimensional alternative semantics, so J could be defined as in 163. So J here, this is written in a slightly strange notation, but um, the definition is that J will take some number of sisters, but we can just say, let's imagine it's two sisters. Its ordinary value of the junked phrase uh, is undefined. But then the junked taking some number of sisters will return a set of alternatives, which will be the union of the singleton sets of those ordinary values. In other words, it will be just a set of the ordinary values of the individual juncts. Then, if we take a phrase like Brie or Cara, Brie J. Cara, for example, that's in 164. It has an undefined ordinary value. It has an alternative semantics value of Brie Cara as a set. And then we build further on top of that 
the sentence of the form Alex likes Brie J. Cara has an undefined ordinary value and the alternative set denotation of the propositions Alex likes Brie and Alex likes Cara in the uh, pointwise composed fashion. Now, um, I'm building on this previous work we cited from Alonzo Valle and Aloni, um, and also uh, from work by uh, Kratzer and Shimoyama, that does this kind of disjunction in a one-dimensional Hamblin semantics. But how are we going to do this in the Ruthian two-dimensional semantics? Let me give you one option first for an existential operator that can apply to disjunction. So this is the exists operator in 166. So this operator takes a sister alpha, and it creates a new ordinary value. There was none, right? And it creates a new ordinary value, which is the, that's the big disjunction over the set of the alternatives. So it looks at the set of alternatives and it will disjoin across those propositions. It, this definition in 166 will then also leave the alternative set alone. It will just pass up the alternative set of its sister. Now let's see what happens if we apply this existential operator to the structure we just generated in 167. We end up now with an ordinary semantic value, which is the value that we want, Alex likes Brie or Alex likes Kara as a proposition. And we also pass up the individual alternatives from its sister, Alex likes Brie as a proposition and the proposition Alex likes Kara. The problem though now is that this violates interpretability. So even though the ordinary value is intuitively what we want this sentence to mean, the ordinary semantic value isn't actually in the set of alternatives. And remember, that's this general underlying principle that is generally not violated when we're just looking at focus. But when we start looking at WH and disjunction, it's possible to violate this. And that's what happens here. So that's going to be a problem. So I claim that instead, there is also another version of the existential operator, a version that is resetting. So we'll define this exists reset operator in 168. So exists reset takes a sister alpha and creates this disjunctive meaning from the alternatives in its complement. That's fine. That's the same as the previous existential operator. But exists reset additionally will be a resetting operator. So it will also set its alternative set denotation after it applies to be the singleton set of that disjunctive meaning. So the result is in 169. The result of Alex likes Brie J. Cara will be the proposition that Alex likes Brie or Alex likes Cara. And the alternative set will be the singleton set of the proposition that Alex likes Brie or Alex likes Kara, and now this does satisfy interpretability. And it's exactly the, the right Boolean disjunction meaning that we want. An advantage of this approach is that we immediately get disjunctive questions, alternative questions, for free by combining these ingredients. And this is basically the intuition for alternative questions spelled out in Beck and Kim. So alt shift applied to the structure with a J, this J phrase, instead will create an alternative question meaning. So we get the propositions, we get the set of propositions, Alex likes Brie and Alex likes Kara as the set of ordinary, uh, as the ordinary value. And then the alternative set denotation will be the singleton set of that question meaning. And so this is a way to get the question meaning, does Alex like Brie or Kara? that alternative question in this Ruthian alternative semantics. Um, so as a concrete implementation then, um, we have to then describe how we actually pronounce these items. So in English, for example, J itself could be pronounced or across the board, even though then in order to be interpretable, it will have to be pronounced, have to be uh, have to have a higher alt shift or exists reset operator, which are unpronounced. But you need one of those in order to get an interpretable meaning out of this 
uh, out of the disjunction, the J phrase. And uh, in English, of course, we pronounce these different types of questions, these different types of disjunctions slightly differently. Um, and we can talk about that in the question period, how we want to tie those together. There are other languages, though, where there are multiple items that would be translated as, would be identified as disjunctors, but are, they're pronounced differently and have different distributions. So in uh, some uh, work in progress, uh, this is a manuscript that I need to go back and revise, I propose that in Mandarin, there are two disjunctors. So there's hai shi and huo. Um, and I propose that hai shi is specifically just the J head itself without any extra annotations. And that means that when you use hai shi, then you're forced again into using some higher operator like alt shift in order to actually get it to be interpretable in many cases. And therefore, in many contexts, that will force you to get an alternative question meaning. And then you also have this, have this uh, disjunctive huo or huo shi or huo zhe. Um, and these items come with a syntactic annotation saying, I need to be checked nearby by one of these existential operators, either exists or exists reset. Um, and so if, it, if exists reset applies, then, then you're going to be using huo, and that's how you get this logical disjunction. But interestingly, there are a number of contexts, as I document in my paper, when these two disjunctions uh, descriptively become interchangeable, at least for a certain class of speakers. Um, and for those speakers where they become interchangeable, then those are positions where uh, you're using one of these existential operators uh, that's going to be forced by the higher semantics. And therefore, both of these are going to be licensed and there's no blocking between them. So um, I, I'll refer you to that work, which I won't spell out in further detail today. Because now I want to spell out this general framework for how we want to think about WH quantification. So remember that in this two-dimensional Ruthian approach, both a WH-containing clause and a J-containing clause will give us a certain kind of slightly strange meaning. It will give us something of the form in 173. So there will be an undefined ordinary value and then a set of propositions as the alternative set denotation. This obviously violates interpretability because we want what we end up interpreting to have an ordinary semantic value. I propose in this framework as a way of really restricting the space of combinatory possibilities, I claim that alt shift the simple exists operator and exists reset introduced above are the only operators in grammars that can define an ordinary semantic value from a sister which does not have an ordinary semantic value. Those are the only options. Um, we then, uh, we can apply alt shift to any of these meanings in 173 to get an interpretable question or we apply exists reset um, to get an interpretable existential disjunctive proposition. We can also use the exists operator, which as we saw before, by itself is going to run into a problem. And so we'll, we'll talk about that case a little bit more today. Um, yes, so we'll spell that out. If we apply this simple exists operator, to the structure in 173, a WH or J containing clause, the result will be the following in 174, that you have the disjunction of those propositions as the ordinary value, but then the set of individual propositions in the alternative set. And again, that continues to violate interpretability. However, now that we have an ordinary semantic value, we can apply a focus particle to this, because focus particle meanings need to look at an ordinary value and a corresponding non-trivial set of alternatives. So this is exactly the configuration where a focus particle could be useful. And a focus particle also has the function, the side effect, of 
fixing the interpreti interpretability problem because focus particles are resetting operators, as introduced earlier. Focus particles can't directly apply to a WH or J containing clause because there isn't an ordinary value. There isn't a defined ordinary value in that structure yet. And that's always necessary for the meaning of focus particles. So now what I'm going to do in the remainder of this time is to show you how this general framework can actually derive a number of attested forms of WH quantification. I'll be highlighting uh, data from three tibeto burman languages here to do so. Um, and I can also, um, here we're going to talk about different kinds of indefinites and NPIs. I also have an extension of this work to derive a universal free choice item in Tibetan um, in a manuscript, um, which I will refer you to as well. So let's first talk about a very simple case. Right? Suppose you have a language where you have bare WH indefinites. WH phrases just by themselves, or at least in a certain syntactic position, can have an indefinite interpretation. So the intuition here, this is very straightforward, is that J disjunctions and WH phrases create similar meanings. So the exists reset operator that we can apply to a J disjunction to create logical disjunction could also apply to a WH phrase or WH containing phrase, and similarly would straightforwardly create an indefinite meaning. So if we do this in 175, we apply the exists reset to Alex likes who, we end up with this uh, sentence, this disjunctive sentence in 175, which is the same essentially as a contextually restricted Alex likes someone. This is also a resetting operator, so we end up with the alternative set being the singleton set of that meaning. So now this is an interpretable, totally fine structure as Alex likes someone. So we would get this to be the representation, the logical representation for a language with bare WH indefinites, so just WH phrases by themselves being indefinite, if J is pronounced as the disjunctive particle in such a language and exists reset is pronounced as nothing. So exists reset can apply freely with no morphophonological reflex. There are also WH disjunctor indefinites. So in many languages, you have a combination of a WH word and a disjunctive particle, the, the particle that we describe as the disjunctive particle. They co-occur together, and that combination is how you form an indefinite. So this is common in a number of different kinds of languages. Here's a selection from four language families here. Um, in these languages, it could be the same semantics at LF, but then a different choice for what the language has chosen to lexicalize. In particular, the realization of disjunction, that disjunctive particle, could actually be the exists reset operator or a corresponding constituent particle corresponding to the disjunctive operator, that exists reset operator, in the operator particle theory that we introduced uh, in the prior lectures. Crucially, J itself will not be pronounced or will not correspond to a pronounced form in these types of languages. Why do I want to say that? What does that mean? The intuition here is that in these languages, when you have items like Hungarian vala or Japanese ka, um, these morphemes, this extra disjunctive morpheme, when you see a disjunctive morpheme, it does not signal that you are using J to create a junct phrase. Instead, it signals that you are using the exists reset operator. That's the intuition. So I want to give you one case study um, which supports this type of view, which can be modeled straightforwardly under this type of view, which comes from this language Tiwa, uh, which is a tibeto burman language. Um, this is from uh, Ginny Dawson's original work, and I should also be citing now uh, her dissertation, which she just completed at Berkeley. Um, so Tiwa offers a very nice example of a language where the disjunctor actually may correspond to 
exists reset, and in particular, different versions of the exists reset operator that the language has. So at first glance, Tiwa has two types of WH indefinites. So there's the WH PA series and the WH key series. And in simple examples like in 177, these have the same meaning. They're just indefinites. However, when you put this in different scope taking, uh, different embedding environments, we notice that PA systematically takes a narrow scope, or WH PA takes narrow scope. WH key systematically takes wide scope. So for example, this is in, an, uh, in a conditional clause. Uh, if Saldi meets WH PA, WH key sister, she would be happy. If you use WH PA, it has to mean that if she meets any sister, Saldi will be happy. Um, if it's WH key, it has to mean there is a specific sister that Saldi wants to meet. If Saldi meets her, then Saldi will be happy. And interestingly, as Ginny notes, um, this correlates to the scope taking, correlates with the scope taking behavior of two disjunctions that the language has, ba and ki. And uh, Ginny notes that the ba in WH uh, in disjunction and the pa in WH pa indefinites are not pronounced the same, but are likely historically related. And the key in these items is actually uh, equivalent. So let's see that evidence. Again, this is in a conditional clause. We can have a conditional, we can have a disjunction, mukton ba mombor, or mukton ki mombor. So if mukton or mombor comes, Saudi would be happy. If we use the ba disjunction, then that's a narrow scope disjunction, meaning that if either of them come, Saudi will, be ha uh, Saudi will be happy. If you use the key disjunction, that has to be a wide scope disjunction. So it has to say that either if Mukton comes, Saudi is happy, or if Mumbor comes, Saudi is happy. I'm not sure which. So I'll refer you to uh, Dawson's work including her recent dissertation, for additional scope facts. Um, but under the type of approach, the type of compositional semantics that I'm exploring here, the uniform wide scope of key disjunction and WH key on the one hand, and the uniform narrow scope of BA disjunction and WH PA disjunction on the other, can be explained if key and BA PA realize two different forms of exists reset. So the proposal is that there's one exists reset operator that necessarily takes wide scope. Maybe it's restricted in terms of its syntactic distribution to being higher. And then there's one exists reset operator that's restricted to being narrow scope, perhaps syntactically restri restricted to be quite low in its syntactic position. And those correlate with the pronunciation on the WH or J of this particle pronounced as ki on the one hand or ba pa on the other. I'll also show you the derivation of WH even NPIs. So we talked a little bit about the, in, de, the uh, derivation, the semantic composition of one even NPIs, such as in Hindi yesterday. But also it's quite cross-linguistically common to have WH even particle combinations as an NPI. In particular, I want to look at a language, so here Tibetan, but Japanese would work as well, where bare WHs are not themselves indefinites. So WHs have to be interrogative, and however, you form NPIs from WH plus even. And that's the situation in Tibetan. So in 180, so we have these two WH items, uh, there are more, of course, but I'll just give you two. So we have su, hu, and gare, what. And they're not related to the indefinite series. So the indefinites are literally like michik, like one person, or kalachik, uh, so um, one thing. Um, but then anyone is formed from the wh word plus this even particle yang. So an example of this is in 181. So su yang lip masong means 
no one arrived. Um, Su Yang Lip Song is just ungrammatical. The proposal is that Tibetan has a free covert exists operator, the simple one, but not a covert free exists reset operator. So let's see what happens. So we will build that example that we just saw in 181. We build first the who arrived clause and apply that simple reset, op uh, excuse me, simple exists operator to that. We now get the proposition that someone arrived or A or B or C arrived, depending on the domain. Um, we get that as the ordinary value. The alternative set value, though, is simply passed up from the meaning of who arrived. And therefore, it's just going to be the set of atomic propositions, A arrived, B arrived, or C arrived. And that's going to violate interpretability. So again, because we just use this simple exists operator by itself, this is not resolved in an interpretable meaning. But we can fix this interpretability problem using a focus particle like even, because focus particles are resetting. So it will resolve this interpretability problem. So now let's try putting an even particle on 182. So that's 183. We put even on this. And now what this means is, well, even doesn't change the at issue meaning. So the ordinary value is passed up. So we just have the proposition that someone arrived. But then we also introduce a presupposition, the scalar presupposition of even, which is that for all other individuals, for, excuse me, for other, it's not other individuals. It's the alternatives in the alternative set in 182. So for each individual alternative, Alex or Alex, Brie, Kara, or whoever, A, B, and C, the proposition that someone arrived is less likely than the proposition that that person arrived. And let's unpack that, right? So the claim that even makes here, based on the meaning in 182, is that it's less likely for someone to arrive than for Alex to arrive. Or it's less likely for someone to arrive than for Bree to arrive. And you'll notice that this just logically is impossible. It's impossible to say that it's less likely for someone, anyone, to arrive than for a particular individual to arrive. Because if any particular individual arrived, that entails that someone arrived. So this likelihood ordering, this scalar inference of even here, is just never going to be satisfied. This is an unsatisfiable presupposition. Because of its logical structure, because of the organization of the alternatives in 182 in relation to the ordinary value that it's taking. It does solve the interpretability problem, though. By using this focus particle, we reset the alternative set. So now that's not a problem. But we have this unsatisfiable presupposition. As we saw yesterday, when we have this unsatisfiable presupposition of even associating with an indefinite, we can fix this, though, by having an intervening downward entailing operator. So if we put negation in between in a clause with negation, and here, the even scoping higher would have to be the position of the logical operator even, even though then we are pronouncing a constituent particle in Tibetan. The, uh, in this configuration, we reverse the inference from the scalar inference from even. So we get that for all individual alternatives, it's less likely that no one arrived than that that one person didn't come. And that is a satisfiable presupposition. In fact, that's always going to be satisfiable, again, because of the logical properties, the entailment relationship between those individual alternatives and that disjunctive existential alternative. So what we get then is that this general calculus explains why the use of even is obligatory in WH even NPIs, even though even itself doesn't make a contribution to the overall meaning expressed. Even repairs the violation of interpretability. That's why it needs to be introduced into the structure. But if we use even to fix the interpretability problem, now we're committed to satisfying the scalar inference of even, and that creates an NPI. So that's another case study. 
I want to also show you another route to an NPI, which is a WH cleft particle NPI. So this is a less common uh, type, as far as I am aware, typologically. But this is a combination of a WH item with a particle that has cleft semantics. And this, too, can, in, can form an NPI. And in fact, this happens in Burmese, uh, where I showed you yesterday that uh, there is a particle ma uh, that ha expresses cleft type semantics, cleft type scalar exhaustive semantics. So this is the core, the basic first uh, data point here in 185. So if we say which apple ma, um, that is ungrammatical in uh, the sentence in 185a, that just has the affirmative verb take. And then if we put this under negation in 185, 185b, now this is, uh, this is grammatical, meaning I didn't take any apple. So recall the proposal from yesterday from my work with Keeley Nu on the meaning contributed by ma. We claimed that ma introduces a presupposition that all that no less likely alternative is true. Or we could say all less likely alternatives are false. That's the formulation roughly described in 186. So we have a set of alternatives. Everything that's less likely than the projacent p has to be false. So consider a context where there are three apples. We're going to try to get the behavior of that example we just saw, where which apple ma was a NPI. Consider a context with 1, 2, and 3 being apples. We add an exists operator again. So I'll propose that in Burmese, which does not have bare WH indefinites, just like Tibetan, you have a free covert exists operator, but not a free covert exists reset operator. We can apply the exists operator in 187. Uh, oh, I see. In 188, I'm sorry, 187 has a typo there, should be no exists operators, right? So in 187, if we just have the clause, I took which apple, its ordinary value is undefined. Its alternative set denotation is just the propositions, I took apple 1, I took apple 2, I took apple 3. Now we apply the simple exists operator to that in 188. We have the disjunctive proposition as the ordinary value. Now I took 1 or 2 or 3. The alternative set has not changed. That violates interpretability. As a way to fix that, we could use ma, that cleft semantics operator. Let's try that first without negation in 189. So this, again, will not touch the ordinary semantic value. It will pass that up. And it will introduce a presupposition that says all less likely alternatives are false. Remember, the ordinary value, you might want to look back at 188. Um, the ordinary value is the proposition that I took one or two or three. The individual alternatives, the atomic alternatives, are I took one, I took two, and I took three. So each of those individual atomic alternatives are systematically less likely than the disjunctive alternative, I took one of the apples. And therefore, ma, just the simple semantics that we wrote for ma, is going to give us the presupposition that you didn't take one, and you didn't take two, and you didn't take three. But now we have a systematic conflict between the assertive content, the ad issue content, that I took some apple, and the presupposition, which is that I didn't take apple one, I didn't take apple two, and I didn't take apple three. Right? So these are systematically incompatible with one another, resulting in this structure also being judged as ungrammatical, or systematically infelicitous, and therefore ungrammatical uh, following Gayevsky, as discussed yesterday. So this goes bad. Notice this goes bad for a different, slightly different reason, related reason, but slightly different reason than the way that WH even NPIs go bad in a non-licensing environment. 
Now, however, in 190, if we take this structure that we just calculated in 189 and add a higher negation to it, this is the structure in 190. Remember, the presupposition we introduced from ma is just going to be passed up. It will just project through negation. So all that we do is negate the assertive content, negate the add issue meaning. So we negate I, I took some apple. So we get the assertion that I didn't take any apple. I took no apple. And we have this separate presupposition that I didn't take one, I didn't take two, and I didn't take three. Now, finally, the structure in 190 satisfies interpretability. So it satisfies that it has an ordinary semantic value that's defined. It's in the set of alternatives. And also, the, assertion me the meaning of the assertion now is compatible with its presupposition. So this is also a valid meaning. And although the addition of ma here doesn't actually con con contribute a presupposition, which actually adds to the overall meaning, it does have the side effect of making the entire structure interpretable, and therefore is not ruled out by non-vacuity, which we discussed yesterday. OK, so just to summarize this section today, um, what I tried to convince you of, what I'm trying to pursue in this project, is that a few independently motivated ingredients um, for the semantics of questions, disjunction, and also focus particles, these items like WH, the meanings of WH and J phrases, alt shift, and the two different exists operators, these taken together from these different related literatures, if we just synthesize them, then actually we can immediately model together the behavior of many attested forms of WH quantification. Crucial in doing this are the roles of these notions of interpretability and reset. So interpretability, again, is this notion, this result, which for simple cases of focus calculation in Ruthian alternative semantics, was just always going to be an obvious result. But once we start looking at WHs and J phrases, actually enforcing interpretability becomes a bit challenging. And that's where focus particles can be useful, because focus particles actually have this side effect of resetting the alternative semantic value. So both of these notions are, again, not entirely no, new notions. They are familiar notions from this literature. But I believe that they hold the key to understanding why it is commonly focus particles and disjunctive phrases, disjunctive expressions, that co-occur with WH phrases in order to form different forms of WH quantification in many languages. So um, I'll stop there. And uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Hello. Thank you very much for the talk. So um, I have two questions, one about TWR and the other about choice function. So um, in TWR, uh, what ensures the wide scope reading of P? Uh, I mean, that may be a very empirical question, but I was just wondering like, how, what, what would be the for, for the, the, the consistent wide scope reading of P? And the second question is, um, uh, how does the notion of choice function fit into the ingredients you propose here. So, and basically, like, what's the difference between um, the of the uh, resetting operator? Thank you. Yeah. So, thank you very much for your questions. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, let me walk through them in turn. Um, I personally. Um, I'm not committed to a particular approach for how to restrict the scope of key in uh, in, in Tiwa right now. Um, uh, so that's just my own um, incomplete understanding of the Tiwa facts. And so something that I still need to do is to really uh, fully process and engage with um, Ginny Dawson's very rich empirical work on the language in order to better under understand exactly how we should be describing 
the restriction. Um, but what I want to emphasize in that section is just really the clear parallel in the scope taking behavior of the key disjunction and the key WH indefinite. And under this framework, if both of those are going to be, they're going to be indirect manifestations because you're pronouncing them in that low position. But if both of those are indirect reflexes of the same logical operator which actually marks the position of scope taking and that's going to be restricted with a particular distribution, then uh, we can explain the neat parallel between them. Right? Um, so the choice function question is a great question. I'm glad you asked. Um, what do I want to say about choice functions? I have opinions about choice functions. Um, so stepping back, um, I should say first, and, and sort of to get everyone on the same page. Um, so uh, I think in the sort of intellectual history of uh, compositional semantics, um, there are three major ways in which, uh, maybe, well, let's start with three. Three major ways that we talk about quantificational meanings or operator meanings taking scope. One is through some form of movement. One is through uh, choice function binding. And another is through, uh, one is through choice function binding and another is through alternative propagation. So the projection of alternatives. Interestingly and importantly, uh, choice function binding and the projection of alternatives uh, are not island sensitive, right? They are not, uh, they, well, that process itself is not island sensitive. There may be other locality constraints imposed because the operator and the corresponding source of alternatives or the corresponding bound choice function variable um, have to be in some kind of syntactic relationship like agree or something like that. So it, it's not a perfect one for one, one to one mapping, but what we think we know is that if you use movement, overt or covert, that should be island sensitive, clearly. But these others uh, should not. Um, now, second of all, then, how do you distinguish the use of alternatives and choice functions? So one possible difference empirically um, has to do with uh, the interaction with uh, intervention effects. So there are various uh, interveners. So I'm thinking of, in particular of the, the sense of the term intervener as in uh, Zigrid Beck's work, such as uh, Beck 2006, that says that certain quantificational items, but, but more importantly, not just quantificational, but really uh, focus sensitive items, other focus particle expressions, if they sit someplace in a clause, then they interrupt the interpretation of for example, famously a WH lower in the clause by the higher complementizer or actually in this framework, the alt shift operator. Um, and that will be disrupted in some way. Um, that kind of disruption, that kind of intervention effect, susceptibility to intervention effects is not predicted um, by a choice function binding approach. And so that potentially is one empirical way of actually really teasing these apart. But the other thing that um, more conceptual point I want to make is that um, the use of alternative semantics, so the use of really Hamblin semantics for the interpretation of WHs for question meanings has been very well established now. Um, and it's a very um, familiar tool. Can it be? restated in terms of choice functions. People have tried to do that. I think it's in, in many ways, there's a similar formula, formulation in terms of choice function binding. But, um, but in, in certain places, they might come apart. And uh, the, w, the alternative computation approach is at least a, a more familiar way of conceptualizing that, that technology of what WH phrases do. And so if we can take that more widely adopted framework or conception for how WH phrases introduce a semantics, and we can productively compose with them 
using the independent, uh, independently motivated semantics for focus particles, then I think that that would be uh, a more compelling way of thinking, com getting these combinations to work rather than by doing all of this um, with a choice function binding. So I don't, I don't think it's impossible. Um, and in fact, it might be very difficult to empirically tease apart, um, which does make me slightly uncomfortable, but um, which is probably why you asked. Um, but, uh, but it's a great question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for the detailed answer. Thank you. Um, could I ask something related to that? So I, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought up the intervention effects class, as that was also on my mind. Um, I, I might just be restating the problem in a way, but um, given everything that we talked about so far, um, it, it seems to be that like um, outshift, uh, the exist operator and exist reset, they are different operators than the ones for like, for example, um, even or only. So then it doesn't it mean that we don't actually predict that there would be intervention effects? Um, <laughs> so there's, um, I mean, there are, different, there are different approaches to what exactly the problem of intervention effects are on the market, but uh, I'll concentrate on um, the Beck 2006 idea, which has to do with interrupting that set of, um, that set of alternatives um, so that the computation doesn't take place in the right way. So roughly, if you have one resetting operator here, then even if that was intended to in associate with one particular focus nearby, if you have something else like a WH lower, then uh, a higher operator like alt shift can't actually make reference to those alternatives because the intervening material was resetting. So, so even though, to, to clarify, even though um, alt shift uh, and exists reset, um, those are resetting, and I said that that and the simple exists are sort of a natural class. I'll come back to why. Um, those three, I, those, those two are resetting. Focus particles are also resetting. And so we should expect an interaction between those that could interrupt one another um, and lead to this classic simple Beck 2006 intervention uh, type of uh, phenomenon. I, I said, I. I emphasized at a few points that alt shift exists and exists reset. Those three um, stand together as a class in the following sense: that um, what I, the hypothesis I'm pursuing in this project is that those three are the only items in the grammar that can actually take a sister that has no defined ordinary value and create a new ordinary semantic value, right? So focus particle meanings do look at the alternative set denotation of their complement, but they don't create, but they can't take, they actually can't combine with something that doesn't have an ordinary value, and they can't create new, or, or they, they do change the, update the ordinary value, but they can't take something that doesn't have an ordinary semantic value. If you are in this position where you have no defined ordinary value, only a set of alternatives. The only way to rescue that in the grammar is alt shift exists and exists reset. That's, that's the way in which those form a natural class. But you're right that alt shift and exists reset form a natural class with focus particles in that they are all resetting operators. Does that help answer your question? Yes. So, so then um, would you say that maybe they particular positions in the clausal spine for, for the intervention effects to pan out? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure. Do you have a particular configuration of intervention that you're wondering about? So, I mean, it, 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 imagine if like um, the, like this natural class is, uh, you know, it, it has a very local relationship with um, the WH um, elements, then it's possible.
possible that you know it's low enough in structure for this problem to be resolved that you don't actually get an intervention in fact. Uh, does that make sense? Can you say that again? So imagine imagine that um, the this natural class, like uh, let's say our ship, right, is there is lower in the causal spine, such that um, the relation um, I say this, such that like it's closer to the WH element, right? So then you can resolve that um, undefined semantic value issue, and then maybe like. Uh, let's say the operator for uh, uh, even is higher up in, in the structure. So in, in that particular configuration, or maybe in some other kind of configuration, would you would you then expect that you still get intervention effects, possibly uh, due to all, all, like the available alternatives having some kind of semantic clash or something? So um, so in theory, uh, you would indeed predict uh, not to get intervention then, when you don't get some kind of crossing configuration, right? So if you just have some alternatives, you process it, you take care of it with one operator, and then you introduce other alternatives, and then you have another operator treat, taking, looking at those alternatives, um, that kind of configuration is fine. And that is uh, what's predicted by um, the Beck types uh, proposal in general. The challenge, though, is that that lower operator um, is not going to be alt shift if what you're trying to get is a matrix question reading, right? So if you're trying to do, so the position of the operator is going to correspond to its scope intuitively. And so um, if you're trying to build a question, matrix question reading, which generally is the kind of configuration that uh, the Beck intervention literature is looking at, then Alt shift is always going to be the higher operator, right? And in fact, then we get the facts right for the classic Beck type effects where, so if you have a lower focus and focus particle, and that is resetting and that's done, and then you introduce a WH higher, and then you have alt shift at the top, that's a WH question where you have a WH and then a structurally lower focus particle phrase. That is grammatical, and it's the opposite configuration where the focus and focus particle intervenes between the WH and the logical position of alt shift, which has to be high. That's the intervention configuration. Does that help answer your question? Yes. So I mean, so then it seems like there could indeed be some kind of a particular, and I don't want to say universal, but there could be a particular uh, configuration to derive the intervention effects and still be able to make the right right? Yeah, so I, I think the kind of thing that we might look for um, might be specifically in my uh, proposal for how we want to think, or how I think we want to think about uh, WH indefinites, for example, would be are there interactions um, between WH indefinites, for example, inside embedded questions maybe, right? So maybe the scope of uh, WH indefinites, in, you know, WH indefinites, maybe morphologically marked, uh, inside an embedded question has to scope in there and it can't scope out of the question perhaps, or if you do so, then you have to be using a different mechanism. Um, yeah, so there might be other ways of constructing these other combinations of operators and in different configurations. And uh, if this is on the right track, and if these alternatives really are all the same, and if the Beck type approach to intervention is correct, I'm saying a lot of ifs, but I, I generally believe all of these things personally. Um, yes, I think we might make some predictions about different combinations of constructions uh, which would be worth, um, which certainly is worth really exploring. So thank you. Thank you. That was a very detailed answer. Thank you.
had a question about, uh, this is sort of a more basic question, about when you were discussing the disjunction operators uh, near the beginning of, uh, uh, of your talk today. Um, uh, they seem to derive uh, um, exclusive disjunction, um, but I'm wondering if they also derive inclusive. Uh, so like under an, if you say something like, uh, do you want uh, cream or sugar in your coffee? The, the most natural interpretation is that you're allowed to have both as well. Um, am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. No, <laughs> I'm oh, thinking. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Um, uh, no, 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 that's fine. Um, uh, uh, because we have technical issues here, too. Um, uh, but can, can we, sorry, can we look at the slide where the, um, uh, where you introduced, introduced the notion of disjunction today? Yes. Um, probably, probably around here, or it was split up a little bit, but. Okay, so here, good. Is this, okay, so first of all, is this compatible with the, um, with the assertion that, um, uh, Alex likes both Brie and Kara? Y yes. Um. Yeah. Like, uh, so the reason I'm asking is that, like there's this general uh, uh, notion that uh, there doesn't, uh, although we have a logical distinction between inclusive or and, ex and exclusive or, there doesn't seem to ever be any uh, morphological or linguistic correlate. To, like uh, so, my understanding, and I might be wrong, is that there's no language that has a um, uh, the one more thing that means inclusive or and one that means exclusive or uh, sort of unlike the you know the interesting things you showed before uh, with um, uh, the specific and non-specific mm -hmm. choice markers um, uh, on I forget which language it was mm -hmm. uh, so um, sorry can I impose upon you to convince me that 169b does get the inclusive reading sure sure um, I mean, so this is really just the propositional logic disjunction. So therefore, you know, it's it's Alex likes Brie or Alex likes Kara, and if either of those are true, then the whole sentence counts as true. And if they both are true, that's fine too. That counts as true, right? Um, so I I do have a thought about um, the exclusive disjunction, or or a thought related to this, which is. I mentioned in passing, so under this framework, um, we can also naturally derive from very similar ingredients the alternative question, um, you know, do you like Brie or Kara, right? That, that, that pitch accent, right, where you're yeah. giving a forced choice, right? And, and in that case, the answers are, uh, I mean, Obviously, you can you can violate this kind of expectation a little bit, but I think generally we think that, and we can, in some languages we can really tell by looking at their meaning under embedding. But uh, we think that those two alternatives are actually exclusive, right? So sometimes, and in some earlier literature, people have confused uh, exclusive disjunction with alternative questions for this reason, right? So um, now in English. Um, well, the classic example is, uh, do you want coffee or tea? Versus, do you want coffee or tea? And um, those two are pronounced very differently in English, for example, right? And under my theory that I have here, um, based on what I've told you so far, there isn't necessarily a reason why they should be pronounced so differently. Um, one thought that I've had is actually that so there's, there's good uh, prosodic work on this that shows that actually when you say, do you want coffee or tea, you actually have a pitch accent on both of those disjuncts, although the way that I'm pronouncing this particular example, the coffee is much more exaggerated. But you have pitch accents on both. And that may be because you actually first have some kind of narrow focus exhaustification operator on each of those first. So in other words, the intuition would be that actually what you're doing by adding that prosody 
is you're actually creating an alternative question, which is not just uh, it's not just this meaning in 170. That is, um, I'll give you the propositions. Uh, you know, you like coffee or you like tea. You're actually creating propositions that are like you only want coffee or you only want tea, right? You sort of you exhaustify each of those first and then create this disjunction and create this alternative question. And that might relate to the fact that you have these pitch accents there. Uh, okay, okay. D does that make some uh, sense? Yes, that is making sense. Uh, uh, part of the reason I got confused, I think it was, if you can go to the previous screen. Yes. This is why I got confused because it does look in this set, the set of alternatives that there's only a single choice. But then this is the one. This is the one you dispensed with, and you went on the one with the next screen. Yes. So, uh, your initial question makes sense, and then what you were just talking about now with the pitch accent. So, so do you like Alex, Bree, or Kara? And again, uh, um, it, it it can't be a sub. It, it can only be one of those. It can't be a subset, like. I like Alex and Bree, but not Kara, or something mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. um, so then what you're saying is if this is a, a disjunction among do you only like Alex, or do you only like Bree, or do you only like Kara, then this gives us the, then that would give us the single, the fourth single choice answer, I think. Yes, that's right, that's right. So you're, my thought is that there you're actually doing something a little bit extra on top of what I presented here in order to actually first make each of those propositions an exhaustive proposition. And then you create a question from that. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Question that's I guess it's quite a naive question in a way. Um, if the if the operator like let let's say like outshoot oh right that class of operators they are introduced later on. Um, is it okay if the meaning is undefined until the point where it you know gets defined? Yes, I. I think that's fine. So uh, while the, you know, so in most of the, yeah, so the idea is that in a question, in most of the tree, right, if you just poke part of it, there's going to be no ordinary value, right? But, um, but along the way, you're still always composing the alternatives. So each of those alternatives is, you know, composing point-wise with all the material all the way up. And so actually each, if you're, let's say we're doing a question, um, each alternative will all look very similar. They will all be something of the form, you know, uh, Alex likes Brie, Alex likes Kara, Alex likes Dana. So you're building up a lot of material that's shared that you just apply to each of those. And then it's true, you don't have an ordinary value, but then at the end you do something uh, with the set of alternatives um, in order to create an ordinary value. That might be to just turn it into the question meaning directly or to quantify over it in some way as discussed. Um, that doesn't have to be at the end of the derivation. That doesn't have to be at the top of the tree necessarily. But wherever you do that then is going to basically be the position descriptively where it takes scope um, and therefore um, for if we're talking about alt shift for questions, that generally is going to be quite high. If we're talking about one of the existential operators and focus particles that I was talking about for WH quantification, that could happen a little bit lower in the clause. It'll it'll correspond hopefully to the scope taking position of the expression. Yeah, I, so I was asking about that because I'm just wondering about. Um, at what point would like the semantics interface with the syntax for this type of computations? So
so um, I wonder what you can can you say more about what you have in mind? I don't know that I don't know that there needs to be much of a connection between the syntax and semantics aside from just you know we have items uh, in the derivation which correspond to meanings and you know sometimes there might be uh, things might be pronounced in a slightly different way through the in the operator particle theory type of way but can you can you say more is there something you had in mind no no so yeah I mean I, I think you basically um, brought up the, the crucial point which is that it seems like this is pretty divorced from syntactic um, computation or you know if you want to call it pre-merge or whatever type of merge you subscribe to so it seems like these are uh, like the semantic computation and the syntactic computation in this case at least seems to be pretty independent of each other right I I think so I mean I think the I mean and and in my mind that's largely a good thing yeah. right um, yes. the the goal here um, the goal for this overall project which I mean if I say so myself I think I think is is the overall project is somewhat ambitious but um, the goal is to actually try to get a lot done to try to get a lot of results without actually introducing much that's new right but to actually take very established existing ideas for wh and focus particles and disjunction and just if you actually put those ingredients together and take that ser take seriously that these alternatives are the same um, actually maybe you can get some good results from it that's the idea but but the this project is very much interested in that compositional semantics and to get the details of the distribution of exactly how these items are realized in different languages, yes, there's some morphosyntax involved with that. Um, that's because things might be realized in slightly indirect ways morphologically. But I don't think there I don't think there's much here that I want to say or need to say about the way that the syntactic derivation proceeds. But may, if I'm missing something. Um, Please let me know. But no, I, I think it's ideal that you don't need to worry about the syntax in, in, in at least like these situations. And you know, if we know enough about it, and then it becomes a problem, then I guess it's someone else's problem, right? So that's the spirit. Good. is about um, the interpretation of the wave expression, but I was wondering um, if you have anything to say about like indefinite, especially like the so-called exceptional scope behavior of indefinite, which seems to be beyond your project, but like they're still closely connected. So, um, yeah, so I mean, it's connected to your earlier question about choice functions. I mean, in my mind, that's right? That's why yeah. Um, so I think that um, yeah, I'll 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 briefly I'll try not to repeat my previous question too much. I mean, I I, I think that um, I think it's okay if we live in a world where there are different forms of indefinites that. Uh, introduce their compositional semantics in a different way or that they take scope in different ways. I mean, this is not a new idea. There might be real existential quantifiers versus choice functions um, that are bound, for example. Um, and there might also be uh, indefinites that actually take scope through alternative uh, computation in this way as well. And this, is, this also, I should, I should flag the idea that indefinites um, may also use alternative semantics to take scope in this way is not a new idea either. Um, it's, although, it's, although it's less popular, perhaps. So it's um, most recently, Simon Charlo's dissertation talks about this a lot but, um, and takes it seriously in an interesting way. But um, 
I think it's okay if we live in a world or if it turns out that the grammar does employ you know, all of these mechanisms or, I mean, it certainly would be perhaps more interesting and restrictive and worth pursuing the hypothesis that it doesn't, that it only uses two out of three, um, perhaps. But, um, but I think um, I sleep fine at night not worrying about, you know, thinking that WH alternatives for indefinites are real and also thinking that, uh, you know, choice function indefinites also exist, which um, I personally do believe generally from, for, for other reasons and in other contexts. Um, so I don't see that as uh, inherently a problem. Um, the only point, I guess, um, is we might hope that these different strategies make different predictions um, behaviorally so that we can tease them apart in some way. The intervention effects that WH alternative indefinites might be susceptible to is the immediate thing that came to mind, but um, perhaps there are others, but that's, that's something um, I think we need to think more about. I have a follow-up comment on the distinction. I mean, I mean, it's like the reassures the, the uh, like the SWH indefinite, I mean, WH expression can combine with some sort of article like, which give rise to the indefinite reading. And I think in those cases, um, like in like ordinary indefinites cannot combine with the same particle to give like some, or to, to, to retain its like indefinite reading. So it seems that there is some intrinsic difference between, I mean, this is not surprising, but like there's still in some intrinsic difference between uh, like ordinary indefinites and WH expression, which uh, may be connected to your suggestion that like they may have different there are um, I mean compositional semantics in terms of like their uh, I mean the ultimate in depth of reading but um, I think I mean that puzzles me a lot I mean that's why like, I'm asking it seems that like at one point if we apply a set of semantics to both then uh, we are losing some distinction between the two different kinds of expression but I don't, yeah, but I'm not suggesting that for these other, you know, classic non-WH indefinites that we also want to treat them as these kinds of WH indefinites that take scope through alternatives, right? I'm not suggesting that. And so, um, and indeed, I mean, if we, if we do take the, the morphology of these expressions seriously, I mean, from a sort of broader typological perspective, um, I mean, we owe we owe a lot of a lot of things to Kuroda's dissertation. But but uh, but one reason that I am not a huge fan of his description of WH items as indeterminate, although I I introduced it at the be beginning, um, is that his description is just to say that these are nouns that are a logical variable. Period. And and that's it. It's colorful and it's it was an it's an interesting idea. But very clearly, you can't just take WH words and actually combine them with normal quantifiers, right? I don't know of any language where you actually say, you know, every who or more, you know, at least two who, right? Um, there are languages where the word like who actually happens to historically relate to a word like person, and then you know, then you do get such effects. But but clear interrogative items which could also be used quantificationally when they are used quantificationally they appear with a certain set of morphology and that morphology tends to be focus particles disjunctive items things like that it doesn't then co-occur with general purpose quantification right it, so it, it, they de at least the morphology cross linguistically suggests these are using different strategies. And I think it's fine if they really compositionally are as well. I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Good. Thank Thanks. Hey, hey Mick Cho. Um, Hello, sorry, Chris. I, maybe this is boring, but you said we don't say every who or whatever, but I mean, in that exotic language spoken in the British Isles, there's definitely everywhere and somewhere. And 
I, I don't know that that's with the quirk or where that comes from historically, but it makes me wonder, are there other languages that actually really do combine in a systematic or semi-systematic way quantificational expressions and their WH items in that way? So yeah, just throwing that out there. No, I, okay. Thank you, Chris. I, I, I probably was far too sloppy. I mean, we, we, we know that this exotic language is very exotic in many ways. So, um, yes, but but the the point is well taken. I mean, it, we should be we should be looking uh, taking that as a hint and perhaps looking for such combinations more broadly as well. To my knowledge, that is not common. But I but I don't know. Thanks. Thank you.